Hi class, long time no see. Uh, today's lecture is going to be more of a combined super lecture. Um, it's going to be comprised of three different sections, industrialization, uh, the Meiji Restoration, and the rise of communism in China. And so uh, I try to link up the three different sections uh, because they have very similar and relevant uh, you know, topics to cover. So we're, uh, we're going to start off with industrialization in Europe and some of the early factory work, how that modernization slash industrialization made its way to um, you know Eastern Asia in terms of uh, Japan, and then talk about the Meiji Restoration, right? Uh, causes and effects of that, and what you know that entire restoration was, uh, and then top it off with the rise of communistic China, which obviously is so prevalent in the news today. Uh, we're not going to get through all of the Chinese history, of course, because it's so vast, but at least we can get started with, you know, what was happening after uh, World War II to a certain extent. Um, and then afterwards, we can, you know, kind of jump back in um, as needed throughout the course. But some topics that we're going to be considering today. Uh, industrialization. Uh, in what ways did it change economies, societies, military priorities, right, throughout the world? Uh, Focusing more on the uh, the island nation of Japan, the Meiji Restoration. How and why did Japan turn from a feudalistic shogunate, and we were we were are going to discuss what a shogunate is, to a modern industrialized empire? Were they successful in these endeavors? Um, how were they successful? How were they not? Uh, and finally, a discussion and history of communist China. How did the communists overthrow the nationalist government within China? What events led up? to the Civil War. Uh, and finally, ultimately, what major ramifications did this revolution have on the country over the decades after the communists finally won over uh, the government? Uh, and so we can get into all of that, how industrialization uh, and modernization kind of plays a factor in all of this, uh, dealing with uh, you know East Asia, Europeans, trade, military, wars, etc., right? All of it in between. So without further ado, let us get started with industrialization. So uh, an early look at, let's say, working systems before, uh, let, you know, factories, before uh, heavy machinery, uh, you know, what did work look like and, you know, was comprised of. Uh, work was typically done in more of a uh, textile slash kind of a apprenticeship uh, type of work. So for centuries, right, people are making good uh, quality products with their hands, right? It is all handmade, requires an enormous amount of labor and skill. Uh, the smaller nations have, let's say, less capabilities of producing goods. Larger, vaster uh, empires, let's say, like the Ottoman Empire, um, you know, ended up having enormous resources because they had hundreds of thousands of these artisans and other folks making these goods by hand. But what is an artisan at the heart of it? It is somebody who is skilled at making these high quality goods. And it takes years for them to uh, to um, hone in on their craft. So you do not just necessarily jump in on being an artisan. Uh, you need to first, uh, you know, gain some type of apprenticeship uh, in a very kind of traditional way. You go up to a master, let's say, for the sake of example, uh, a blacksmith, right? If you want to make armor and all of these other stuff, uh, you go up to the master blacksmith and you say, you know, I want to study under you. Or perhaps, let's say, a family member on your behalf says you are going to study under the blacksmith. Uh, and so after years of study, this young apprentice, um, you know, who's just learning, you know, uh, learning the you know, tricks of the trade, eventually becomes a journeyman. Um, this is where you know, this individual finally becomes skilled enough to work with the master, um, but not necessarily enough so to own their own shop. So an apprentice, think of it as a young child up to teenage years, journeyman, teenage years up to, let's say, early adulthood. And so those are the formative years where you're really like working alongside with the master, honing in your craft until eventually your skills are at the same level or perhaps even greater than the supposed master. Um, and then you can, you know, go off on your own. And so this has been, you know, essentially the way of the world, uh, not just throughout, let's say, Britain and Europe, but from, you know, around the ancient world all over. Whenever you wanted to get into a specific type of profession, 
uh, you needed to learn from somebody else, right? And so this uh, entire system got turned upside down with the introduction of the Industrial Revolution. And what was it and why was it so significant? So if the entirety of the world is using this one mode of production, right, and let's say essentially economics, uh, with the introduction of eventually factories, uh, mechanization, steam, right, all of these different things that they can use now, um, they are slowly going to convert uh, making these products by hand into making the product from machines. Thus, over time, instead of, let's say, you needing to hire 200 individuals, right, to produce whatever it is you're producing, now perhaps you only need to hire maybe 50 because, you know, the machines are doing most of the work and everyone else is kind of just overseeing the machines. And so over time, what we see is a more transition towards wage work. So by the late 18th and 19th centuries, uh, we start to see that merchants and uh, businessmen and moguls alike are starting to uh, invest in these new types of machines, right? Whatever form they are. Um, and we're not going to get into all of the specific nitty gritty details of them. But, you know, they start to invest in all these various machines. And over time, people are understanding that, oh, I can just purchase the machine and it is going to work like clockwork and be far more productive than me hiring X amount of individuals. Um, it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be faster. And overall, I will receive more profits from it. Uh, and a similar system um, within Britain starting out called, uh, called the putting out system uh, was then also kind of evolutionized um, to hire additional family members uh, for this kind of uh, type of work style. And so, you know, this notion of getting rid of these people who are apprentices, journeymen, masters who require many years of skill and they charge good you know good money for their skills you eventually want to start letting them go and fire them in order to start this putting out system and, and hire kind of subcontractors and all of this cheap labor on a temporary basis so that they can do the work and it's much cheaper for you essentially and so over time we see that um you know folks are uh you know some are still kind of in this kind of traditional uh journeyman masters right foundry type of location learning and honing their craft over years of experience uh whereas we can start uh to see uh down the road that it's not going to be the case but here this is a perfect example right of a master apprentice working side by side year after year right um training of the utmost perfection and of course the goods are going to be of a higher quality handmade goods are always going to be better quality than machine smiths uh, however, the price right uh, jumps up exorbitantly as well. Uh, this is one uh, excellent primary source I have, and this is you know kind of spanning off into the U.S. Just because um, at the time of the Industrial Revolutions in the 1800s, uh, we start to see that uh, Britain slash especially the United States, because they really take it and run with it. Uh, you know, we start to see a complete change of rules and regulations and the entire concept of wage work. Um, and so this particular individual within the U.S., but this can be also kind of um, extrapolated towards Britain, right, or any other kind of, uh, let's say, quote unquote, modernizing uh, nation at the time, how they saw their work at the factories. So this individual person says all persons employed by the company um, must devote themselves assiduously to their duty during the work hours. And then later on, he uh, let me get my pointer here. But later on, he says, um, we need to show that we are a laughable love of temperance and virtue um, and that we have senses of moral and social obligations um, and that every individual needs to be um, free of right uh, addict any addictions right free of gambling. Otherwise, they are going to be dismissed from service of the company. Um, spirits are banished, essentially alcohol, right, is banished from the company grounds. Um, and all games like card games and just horsing around are prohibited within the boarding house. So essentially, like as this individual is talking about 1800s, right, working in a new type of factory under rules and regulations, uh, business is number one and you are there for work. So the mindset and mentality is now changing towards wage labor. And this is something you and I can all relate to because we now live in a modernized capitalistic world of society where wage labor is king. 
you can walk anywhere into almost any store and somebody is working for an hourly wage and so this is going to be eventually right the foundation of our current economic models and systems and so the traditional small scale um, productions that we saw right can can be put under the umbrella of cottage industries uh, you know so those were kind of like small based uh, you know factories or family owned businesses or something of that sort where they are making the products and the services and skills um, you know by hand um, you know so let's say if you're taking that apprentice journeyman master mentality and you're kind of bumping up a little bit so it's still a family owned business and they're making good products um, eventually though all of this additional mechanization is going to kind of make them obsolete we have the introduction of water power, uh, the introduction of textile mills, right, and operating mills, where you start to have the harnessing of streams and rivers uh, to, you know, rotate those large, uh, circular kind of, you know, uh, uh, mill, you know, uh, mechanisms, right, so that they could grind and, you know, uh, essentially have unlimited amounts of energy. So you don't need to hire individuals just to like push and pull, right, all day long. Um, work was now becoming more specialized. That was probably an also uh, important concept uh, as we're kind of moving uh, away from skilled artisanry towards wage labor uh, because now instead of me paying you this master at whatever craft you are, um, you know, which your price tag is going to be exorbitant. Now I could pay somebody a very cheap wage labor because I only need them to do one particular job, right? Which is requires, you know, does not require... 10 to 20 years of skill, uh, you know, I could train them in a month or two to do this very simple repetitive task. And if I don't like them, they are interchangeable. And I can, you know, kick them out of um, the factory and hire someone else. So once again, the entire mentality is starting to change as far as industry goes. And so we start, start seeing these large mills, right, harnessing the power of, uh, you know, the rivers, right, and kind of, you know, always having these you know, non-stop moving mechanisms and machines, uh, creating factories in whatever sense of the word, right, that they have uh, in order for whatever's happening inside to continually kind of run, right? The process is never ending. Um, and children at this time are not exempted. Life is getting hard and difficult. Um, as we start getting more and more industrialization, it has a social impact as well. Uh, because folks start to flood the cities, right, throughout the 1800s, um, as Britain and the U.S. and other uh, kind of uh, quote-unquote modernized territories are, you know, growing with a number of industries, factories, etc., wage work. Um, people are flooding towards these areas because there's work, right? Um, more factories are springing up, more jobs are springing up. And so people are just, you know, wanting to make an extra, some extra income. And children are not exempted. So especially if your family is struggling at this time, you are having your seven, eight, nine year old go and work, right? Especially for these larger machines because their fingers are small and tiny. And so anything wrong in the machine, they could fix, right? And they are small enough to get into the small, um, you know, crevices of the machine itself. So uh, you know, child labor, definitely, definitely pre uh, present at this time. So by the turn of the century, right, by the early 1800s and onwards, Great Britain by itself is the most advanced textile mill machine making area of the world. Um, they are producing an enormous amount of products and selling it. Um, and so as a result, they eventually want to stop uh, any kind of immigration of mechanics and skilled workers. So essentially, if you have a really good thing going on, you do not want to lose all your engineers and like for them to go around the world and sell your uh, state secrets. And so they quote unquote attempt to kind of stop this um, bleeding effect of knowledge. But of course, knowledge permeates everywhere, right? You can't stop it. Uh, and so we have uh, individuals such as just one example, Samuel Slater traveling to the U.S., uh, you know, memorizing all of these plans from textile mills and building one himself in Massachusetts and later making vast sums of profits, right? And so the ultimate goal of having all of these new factories, new modes of business is going to be profit at the end of the day. Uh, making parallels to, let's say, modern life today. Uh, most businesses, 
are electing to go towards the mechanization route, right? Because why am I going to pay 200 employees when I can hire five? And then the machine works around the clock, right? And so this is the beginning of the modern age. Uh, and we start to get something very, uh, we start to see mills such as the Boston Manufacturing Company uh, created over time. And just as one, you know, example, right? And so the Boston Manufacturing Company uh, was kind of an offset shoot from uh, the kind of England, uh, British version of their mills uh, made to be kind of a, a recreation, but on a grandiose level. And so even here in the US, we're seeing these large, large investments towards manufacturing companies, towards um, uh, towards business, right? Uh, this new mill requiring around $400,000 to go into establishment, but makes up in profit so fast. Um, and as they are hiring all of these new wage workers, there's a term called de-skilling, the process of machines taking over the labor of people and creating repetitive steps in their jobs. So once again, I can hire you for cheap as a wage worker and having a specialized slash de-skilled job, it requires almost no skill. I can train you in a few days or a week, do this small repetitive task over and over again, I will pay you five bucks an hour. Right, or however much a very low wage would be at that time. And so we start getting right uh, sites like this popping up all over. Let me get my pointer here. Notice how it is on, let's say, the bank of a river, right? So you could harness some type of uh, water mill and energy um, and the factories, right, themselves uh, producing uh, whatever it is that uh, the business needs to produce. And uh, over time, as you might imagine, uh, we start getting an influx of goods um, through industrialization we start getting uh, you know objects and materials becoming a lot more affordable so instead of the traditional route of having an apprentice or a master create something for you which would be very expensive and handmade and top quality now we're getting these factories churning out a similar product not as high quality but you know still decent quality but just churning them out like crazy which brings the uh, cost down which brings the sale price down so over time we're starting to see um, in the 19 in the uh, end of the 18th and then in the 19th centuries as well we start to see that families are now consuming more they can purchase all of these goods and better their lives have better um, houses more uh, comfortable means of living uh, more items of clothing, uh, etc. Uh, perhaps buying later on a new kind of uh, luxury item, right? Um, and upgrading your lighting situation or your cooking or your burners or maybe some new furniture, whatever it is. Um, life, right, is kind of starting to improve, right? Because these products are becoming more widely available uh, and affordable for people. And so you'll see a bunch of these new uh, you know, kind of like, let's say, burners and lighters. And of course, on the right hand side, right, we have there like, you know, this cooking station. Uh, and instead of one small burner, now you have like six, right. And so folks are starting to uh, improve, right, their lives through mechanization. But of course, as we've been discussing, there's pros and cons to that. Pros are all of these goods and items are becoming far more accessible right and cheaper to purchase and make your life better the negative cause of this is that your neighbors and your neighbor's neighbor are now going to be unemployed because the factory owner does not need as many workers we are currently and i'll make another parallel right we are currently seeing the same exact thing in today's day and age how many of you go on amazon and purchase something through amazon prime because you need that two-day shipping but you know, workers in, you know, the modern day and age are becoming far fewer, right? Unemployment is skyrocketing. Older individuals do not know how to, let's say, go into the job market because it's shrinking, right? Uh, it, these are viable questions. And arguably, even in today's modern age, we are now seeing ourselves in a new, um, not just industrial revolution, but, you know, the technological revolution of our day and age. And so for our generation, uh, and for our kids, it is probably going to be all uh, technology, all coders, right, and techies uh, 
anyone else that's not on that kind of bandwagon um, is probably going to find themselves in a difficult pinch. However, I still will make the argument that you know uh, all of the software and whatnot still cannot do uh, physical laborious jobs. So, for instance, everyone who goes into uh, trade techs and learns how to work with their hands and build materials, your jobs will still be relatively safe, I would say, for the time being. Unless machines are going to learn how to do all of those uh, things, but it's, it's too complex for the time being for them. Uh, we have other primary sources such as this. I'll, I'll use the U.S. as an example again, where this is in Cincinnati. Um, where we have like uh, we have a brother writing to his other brother uh, in a letter essentially and let me give my pointer here um, essentially saying you know about the city of Cincinnati so many different buildings right uh, mer merchant mercantile stores mechanization all these large buildings glass factories the steam mills um, all of these different banks and printing offices essentially business is booming cities are growing uh, jobs are plentiful, right? So this is kind of the kind of quote unquote mantra of industrialization or modernization that is very successful in these areas. And then as we're going to see in other parts of the world down the road um, in this lecture, other areas of the world are going to see and read about all of this and they would want to emulate it, right? As time goes on for better or for worse. And we start to get a, you know, a differentiation in societal class, right? So how do societies change during the uh, onset of these industrial revolutions? Uh, we start to see that we start getting the formation of a middle class and a working class. The middle class being the, uh, you know, uh, sort of owners of small businesses, stores, uh, you know, not necessarily, you know, kind of struggling for money, but you know, they, they work hard, they're middle class, they're saving up money, um, and they can afford to send their children to school, right, to get more discipline, to get more education. Hopefully their children are going to move on to bigger and better things. Um, and they see their children as being an investment, not necessarily a labor source for wage. Versus, we start to get the emergence of this working class, right, the wage labor class, where um, they are trying to emulate that middle class or upper middle class lifestyle and dream. And although they want to keep their wives and their children out of work, uh, the economic situation is so dire that they cannot necessitate it otherwise. Uh, and so the children might have a couple or a few years of schooling just to get by, uh, but then into the factories, right, for them to work and put food on the table and help the family support themselves. So income is the number one priority for the working class, right, versus the middle. And we are going to start to see this kind of differentiation as time goes on. Uh, here are a couple wonderful videos of child labor um, in the 1800s uh, between uh, Great Britain and the United States because these are two large uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, havens of industry. Uh, in the day and age. And so great uh, short videos. So if you have some time, definitely look at those. Um, they are very uh, interesting and eye-opening. Ah, co-production and innovations. So as you might imagine, um, as we are going through the Industrial Revolution, as we're having all of this new... Um, let's say economic boon, right? Factories being made, different uh, machineries, right? Kind of being created to speed up the production of goods and labor. Uh, we start to see kind of these larger processes as well. Steam engines, right, are coming into fruition, harnessing the power of steam in an enclosed big, uh, you know, iron case. Uh, and so, you know, the more steam you have, the more power this engine is going to produce and therefore is going to spin the cylinders. And therefore, let's say you can put this huge steam uh, engine on a train and start to move people and goods that much faster. And so now, instead of folks needing to either walk or rely on horseback, right, for their transportation needs, you can get on a train and cut that time in, you know, a fraction of what it used to take to travel somewhere. And so, you know, an enormous amount of, uh, you know, an enormous leap technologically, right? And lifestyle wise, people and goods and even going into, let's say, military, right? Any, any usage of that 
you can travel that much faster. Uh, and one of the big uh, sort of factors of the invention of the steam engine and trains and all of this um, additional uh, technology coming forth is because of the uh, very lucky virtue that Great Britain was sitting on an enormous pile of coal. Uh, they were, unbeknownst to them until they discovered it, right, had vast coal mines underneath the ground. And so as soon as they started to find out that they had coal, they started to put them in furnaces and find out that, wow, coal burns very easily and it expends a lot of energy, right? It's sort of like a miracle fuel. Not great for the environment, obviously, but, you know, in this day and age, you're not worried about that. Uh, and so, you know, as they start to find out that coal is sort of this magic, uh, you know, ingredient, they start tossing it more into steam engines, and that propels even more energy for longer periods of time. Um, and so, you know, they are able to, let's say, uh, build bigger and better steam engines, or let's say if they need coal for other processes, such as uh, instead of just making iron steel rods, or just, excuse me, iron rods, if you want to make steel rods or steel beams, right, to make steel requires an even hotter process, right, of trying to uh, melt all of this, you know, uh, metals and right, create whatever you need to create. Um, and so coal is even more important. Uh, by uh, 1700, five-sixths of the world's coal production was mined in Britain. So just from uh, sheer geographic happenstance, uh, Britain was just lucky that they were sitting on this bed of coals, right, during this technological revolution. And so what many folks always ask me is like, well, why did the Industrial Revolution start in Britain? That's the main reason why. You know, it's part of it is all of the ingenuity. The other part, vastly, is because they were sitting on all this coal. Right. Because let's say if the coal was halfway around the world and they had to import small chunks of it, which was astronomical cost to them, this would not have played out the same way. Uh, mining obviously has its own dangers uh, with gas explosions, roof cave ins. And God forbid, if there's a huge collapse of the mine, trying to rescue uh, individuals and miners uh, that are inside these mines were absolutely gruesome. And so you start to see this original form of. Uh, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, uh, sorry for paraphrasing it, right? But, you know, uh, soot face, right? Or black face, as they used to call it. Um, and so, you know, these individuals will come out of the mines, uh, faces just covered in dark black soot. Uh, God knows they didn't have masks on uh, all the time. And so, you know, they would be breathing in all of these harsh chemicals, right? And all this harsh uh, soot. Um, you know, getting illnesses and respiratory diseases, etc. Right? Not easy jobs, but you know, one that the nation wanted, right? Because coal production was through the roof, and so factories grew. Coal demand, coal demand was at an all-time high, and so more mines were being created uh, for the production of coal, and it was like a cyclical cycle, right? And so we have uh, plenty of individuals going into this type of work, right? And once again, especially children. Uh, children were very, um, you know, an easy resource. They were a plentiful resource because if you have a f big family and you have like eight children running around, put them to work, right? Send them into the mines, um, have them be a paper boy, right? Or whatever else. So definitely not an easy life for folks uh, during this day and age. Um, and so, you know, if you have a younger sibling and they're eight, nine years old and they're complaining about, I don't know, Something went wrong on Am Animal Crossing or something on their video game. Point them to these type of photos and be like, you know, be lucky you're not mining in a coal mine, right? Ah, speaking of steel, remember I said that uh, coal would be very useful in the production of steel and those steel beams. So steel is a much more durable, flexible, and stronger version of iron. And so whatever we had earlier with let's say iron beams and creating buildings or bridges or whatever else steel would be that but even stronger and so uh eventually you know we started to uh come up with the process of making right crucible steel right high quality steel but it was still pretty darn expensive uh early on so the idea is you pour uh you you, you know throw chunks of iron in there you superheat it thanks to coal, right? Because it gets hotter and higher, hotter infinitely and you just keep dumping more coal in. 
Uh, and so you superheat the materials and you're eventually pumping extra carbon into the mix, therefore making steel. Uh, it's a very interesting process, but it does require that uh, coal to really superheat things. Uh, and so eventually we have the Bessemer process um, where uh, Mr. Bessemer starts to actually make a very inexpensive process for some type of mass production of steel uh, because steel was you know a process you could do previously but uh, it was very time intensive and cost intensive Bessemer process kind of you know made it far more viable the world's best example of this would be Andrew Carnegie and his steel mills in the United States in the 1800s this man uh, was a Scottish immigrant dirt poor because of all this indes industrialization we were talking about with uh, the cottage industry being converted into mechanization, people losing their jobs, etc. Uh, his father lost his job. His mother uh, ends up, you know, essentially taking care of him and his younger brother. They were dirt poor, moved to the United States when he was very young. And he worked his way up through the industry, through telegraphing, through the railroad system, eventually buying his own steel mill eventually uh, out competing and buying all the other steel mills. And so he becomes the monopoly mogul of steel in the US. Eventually, he sold all of his shares to Mr. JP Morgan. If uh, that name sounds familiar, if any of you have a Chase bank account. Um, but eventually, he sold it for something like $420 million back in the day and age. Converted to today's money, that's approximately 300 plus billion dollars. So he overnight became the wealthiest man in the world. And so steel is definitely right on the map. And this, you know, are just some examples of this industrialization process. Right. And let's say the promise of, quote unquote, a better future, the promise of larger cities, more bridges, more railroads, uh, faster transportation. Right. So, you know, just modernizing the nation, modernizing your people. And so. Uh, we start seeing factories like this spring up all over train tracks and railroads having more of these goods right brought in and brought out input output uh you know making these processes even faster more efficient more reliable right than ever before uh, and of course the sheer scale of let's say making steel or whatever else in this case steel this is part of carnegie's uh, steel mills these large vast um processes that took the Bessemer process and essentially evolutionized it right into even more ef effective efficient version um, and so they're superheating the materials and pouring them in large quantities and making all of these uh, steel beams right and whatever other factors or forms that they need steel in uh, and so quite literally right thanks to all of this we are now living in right vast cities skyscrapers strong bridges right all of these wonderful usages of steel uh, if anybody ever wants to uh look at this video of mr vanderbilt in the united states uh he was seen at one time as the railroad mogul right of the day and age and so it's quite fascinating to view his rise in the railroad business um and the reason I'm kind of bouncing between Great Britain and the United States, because I know the readings are a little more focused on Britain and the Industrial Revolution, is because the first slash second Industrial Revolution was also within the United States. And the U.S. truly, you know, boomed, right, under Carnegie, under the steel mills, and especially the railroad industry. And so here we have plenty of, uh, you know, political cartoons of uh, Vanderbilt, right, sort of buying up all of these different smaller railroad companies, right, and sort of uh, wanting to conglomerate them into a massive, uh, you know, holding of his. Um, and eventually we have, uh, at the time in the 1800s, the greatest railroad system in the world. At one time, the British Empire and in Britain had, quote unquote, the largest and best railroad system in the world. And then within a few short decades, the United States took all of that knowledge and ran with it. And the U.S. ended up having the most intricate um, railroad system in the world and were the envy of all other modern, uh, you know, European or East uh, Asian uh, countries, right? And so he, this particular photograph is from the West and East uh, railroad companies, and they finally met in the middle of the country, right, for the uh, transcontinental uh, union, uh, you know, railroad. And so, as legend has it, 
and this monumentous occasion and event, uh, you know, finally the two railroads met and connected the east and the west uh, U.S. coasts. Uh, they were popping champagne. They were enjoying themselves. And at this very center, once those uh, multiple beams of steel railroad track finally met up, they hammered in a solid gold or almost nearly solid gold, um, you know, pick, right, to kind of commemorate the uh, joining of the railroads. Uh, stretching across the landscape, connecting so many miles um, of territory, uh, definitely an envy of the known world. And so uh, industrialization and modernization is a two-sided coin, right? On the one hand, the state, the government, the military capability, the economic capability can soar. Uh, obviously, you're connecting all of these various parts of your territory, um, and people can move faster, goods are transported much more efficiently, etc. Right? It speeds things up. Uh, w a few negatives that we're not going to get into as heavily here, but just for the sake of uh, speaking, a few negatives are uh, when people are crowding to all of these large cities, obviously you start getting issues like overpopulation, overcrowding. Uh, let's say sanitation goes down. Uh, and, you know, and uh, people getting paid almost nothing for cheap wage labor. Uh, anybody watching this video right now, if you're working a minimum wage job or something similar to it, where sometimes you're coming home brutally exhausted from an eight or 10 hour day, right? And you feel like you're not getting paid enough for your hard work and labor. That is the byproduct of these early wage systems. So it's very interesting to go back and kind of study and review some of these uh, early, you know, kind of formations of, uh, you know, uh, economics, right? Um, and see where it started. And perhaps we can have a greater understanding of why we are in the situation we are today as far as economics go. And that is the end of part one. Moving on to part two, the Magi Restoration. Um, and no, not the if you're a fan of the mummy movies, not the not the Magi, right? Uh, with Brendan Fraser, but this is uh, within Japan, right? The Meiji Restoration, and we're going to discuss uh, why why are we studying Japan necessarily? Um, you know how Japan ended up getting uh, control of, let's say, their territories, uh, how they ended up modernizing so quickly, and what the difference in this distinction was. Uh, they have a very interesting history as far as uh, you know uh, Eastern Asia goes, uh, and we can talk about the differences between Japan and China and some of these successes and long-term faults uh, in between. So, but before we can start with, uh, let's say, the true modernization of Japan and having a discussion about that, we must first discuss the downfall of the Shogun. If you do not know what the Shogun is, uh, sit back and relax, I will explain. If anyone here is a fan of the Total War video game series, uh, two of those games were Shogun Total War, that is how I got introduced years and years back, right, as a teenager myself to all of these type of topics, and it's been um, a lovely ride ever since. But what was the shogunate? So in feudal Japan, as we're having samurais, as we're having bows and arrows and katanas um, and all of these local warlords uh, called daimyos, uh, a land where... There are numerous daimyos, essentially warlord leaders, um, in charge of their own various territories and their armies and their people. Eventually, a shogun control uh, ends up going into control. A shogun is essentially the superior military leader. One of the daimyo, one of those warlords, ends up being so powerful that they conquered all of Japan. Uh, and all of Japan was under their jurisdiction and rule. And so for a few hundred years... We ended up getting rule under the shogunate. Um, and it was a very interesting dynamic because they had the emperor of Japan. Uh, and now we have this military leader that is ruling the, uh, ent the entirety of Japan. So essentially, at this point in time, for hundreds of years, the emperor ends up being more of a... Uh, uh, how to phrase it? He ends up being more of just a ceremonial position, right? The shogunate, the true military leader, has most of the power. Uh, but at times, the government was a bit unstable because everybody wants to challenge the shogun for ultimate power. Um, and so eventually, another 
more powerful shogun could arise and let's say dethrone the other shogun. Um, and so that cycle continued um, until we got to the Edo uh, period. The Edo period was the rule under the uh, Tokugawa shogunate where it was much more stable. So this was a period of time when this particular shogun family came in and ruled with an iron fist, but you know, God be, it came with some advantages. Economic growth, very strict, let's say social uh, society, pyramid structure. Um, and you know, life and peace and law and order was good. But they had, for whatever reason, a much more isolationist foreign policy. Now, historians uh, talk amongst themselves, why did the Japan for, you know, kind of just want to close up and get rid of foreign influence? And so many believe that because the Portuguese and the Spanish were sailing around the world, starting trading posts, uh, starting to uh, spread their missionary beliefs and goals around the world, uh, many believe that the Tokugawa shogunate wanted to uh, expel all of these sort of, uh, you know, European influences out of Japan for good. Uh, and so this is probably most likely, right, a direct result and influence of that. And so, you know, the, the Edo period was, you know, one marked with stable rule, as we see on the left hand side of this very powerful uh, shogun sitting down on his, uh, you know, seat of power. And on the right hand side, culture, art, literature flourished during these times, right? Um, as we had prosperity, as we had people uh, focused less so on warfare and more on, let's say, uh, the more cultural pursuits of life. But of course, you had your massive citadels and buildings still alive today uh, in Japan and available for viewing, right? If you ever go there as a tourist. Now, fast forwarding a little bit. So we were discussing the United States a little bit and how they were modernizing. Uh, the railroads were building and they were expanding just like Great Britain. And we just finished discussing uh, how Japan was under an isolated shogunate military rule. As the United States starts to expand and as the United States wants to open up more trade routes, uh, we start to see that uh, Japan and the Eastern Asian countries are going to be on their radar. And so that very strict uh, isolationist policy that Japan had, the official name for it was Sakoku, where they did not want foreigners, they did not want uh, you know any kind of outside interaction. And if a Japanese person uh, left Japan and came back and people found out about it, you would be executed right by the penalty of death. But this isolation policy was then broken by the United States because they wanted to enter into trade agreements with Japan and especially China, which was seen as the breadbasket, right, of the world as far as trade goes uh, and has been for centuries, right? If you've studied the Silk Road, um, all of the various dynasties of China, right, they had an immense presence, right, in world history. And so this individual in particular moment in history is called the Perry Expedition, uh, where we have Commodore Matthew Perry uh, come in and essentially just with a sheer, uh, you know, showing and demonstration of power, uh, came in and, you know, was showing off their military might with their warships, with all of their um, artillery. Uh, actually ended up uh, getting into some skirmishes early on, but then essentially was they were intimidating the Japanese into uh, opening up trade for the Americans, right? Essentially saying, we know that you do not want to trade, you have your isolationist policies, but you have no choice in the matter because we are militarily superior. We are the big dogs. We're coming in and telling you what to do. And so for a very honorable, warlike, let's say, culture, nation like, like feudal Japan, that was seen as immensely disrespectful, right? The fact that this foreign power just came in and forced their hand. Uh, and so they did open them up for trade. And eventually, a year or two later, 
This opened up the floodgates for the rest of Europe, such as Britain, Russia, France, um, and others to come in and start trading with Japan. And so we start having these early on uh, scenes and paintings, right, of these Western foreign powers coming in and trading uh, with Japan um, and having these kind of interactions, right? Uh, and these officers trying to, you know, speak with the Japanese royalty and the Japanese uh, emissaries, right, about what to do. And here in the background, you can uh, clearly see all of the warships here, right, a very strong showing of military strength, right, and all of the troops here with all of their brand new uh, guns and repeating rifles. So in comes the Magi. So what was it and why was it why is it necessary for us to look over and study? So as the United States and in turn all of these other European nations come in and forcibly want to trade with Japan, it leaves the Japanese government and especially the emperor who over time starts to gain more power over the shogunate because the shogunate essentially is going to be no more, right? As soon as, uh, you know, the foreign European powers are coming in and essentially dictating what all of Japan is going to do. Uh, if your entire legitimacy to power as the shogun is you are the top supreme military ruler and everyone should obey you, uh, th that argument essentially starts falling apart very quickly, right? Because you no longer are the top military presence. The Americans and the Europeans are. So the shogun starts to lose an immense amount of respect and authority through Japan. But the emperor, which has longer lineages of, let's say, uh, you know, heavenly descendant power, very similar to the monarchies we've been studying in Europe, right? Uh, you know, starts to come up more in prominence. And so under Emperor Meiji, uh, and he was only a young boy when he came into uh power uh, because his father passed away but he had his cabinet and his council uh you know speak with him and they all collectively started to agree on this new policy and uh later as he grew into adulthood he uh, ended up pursuing this more and more so uh but the entire point of the major restoration was they were looking at all of the sort of bullying that was going on from the western powers on these eastern powers uh, and they were seeing all of the um, the forceful trade and interactions and the bad negotiations and trade deals that they were forced into. Uh, they were also looking across the pond at China because even before they went into uh, Japan, China had been uh, sort of stripped of much of its power and prestige. Uh, the Europeans had come in and traded with China already and forced uh, these kind of horrific trade deals with them. And so Japan and the Japanese were looking inward at themselves and saying, you know, we as a people and as a entire section of the world, we're being essentially used and manipulated and attacked. And so the entire point of the Meiji Restoration is to modernize Japan in the fastest possible way so that they can stand up against these foreign threats. And so uh, Emperor Meiji and his cabinet, they understood that they now needed to forcibly bring feudal Japan into the modern era and get as many warships, guns, rifles, cannons, modernization, whatever else they needed so that they could stand up to the foreign powers. So that they could not just send their fleet randomly and say, we are going to impose X, Y, and Z tr uh, treaty on you, right? Uh, and so that is the entire point of the Meiji Restoration. And so they start to uh, look at, right? Because if you want to uh, get onto, let's say, a similar footing or level, right? Militarily, quote unquote, as these other powers, you are also going to start incorporating some of their governmental uh, structures as well. So we start to see in uh, 1868 called the Charter Oath, uh, which Emperor Meiji, uh, you know, was uh, signing. This was the first legal stage for Japan's modernization. Uh, and so considered the first constitution draft um, 
you know, in the uh, empire. And later in 1889, they would have a more official Magi constitution formed, where it was a mixture of constitutional and absolute monarchy policies based on the Prussian and British models, having a lot of, um, you know, similar wording on European models of government. But once again, you want to model yourself after those countries. So, right, they are incorporating some of their uh, usages as well. And so Emperor Magi back in the day was extremely brilliant. So he understood and his cabinet and his advisors all understood that the European powers and the American powers came in with stronger guns, stronger fleets, stronger armaments. And so what they ended up doing was hiring the best of the best from across the world. They were trying to hire the best, the best, um, you know, Prussian uh, military officers. Let's say to train their land forces. They were hiring the best, um, you know, let's say uh, Dutch uh, fleet makers, right, uh, in the world. They were hiring warriors and officers and railroad makers from America, right. They were hiring folks from around the world, bringing the best towards Japan, and essentially saying, "Build us up as fast as you can with the most modern technology," and so. In a staggeringly quick amount of time, Japan goes from this feudalistic society towards a more Western, uh, you know, modernized, uh, you know, nation where they start getting railroads, they start getting more military equipment, they start getting, uh, you know, sort of uh, these modern, more education schools, right? Uh, modern forms of government, right? Everything that they can do to bring themselves as fast as they can into the modern age. Uh, and so we start to see. Uh, the conversion of, let's say, all of the traditional uh, kimonos and all of the traditional forms of dress. Now in the, uh, you know, imperial court, we see westernized clothing. Uh, we start to see a more westernized version of government, right, and seating of power. So traditionally, right, this type of scene would be uh, everyone wearing a traditional kind of kimono garb uh, and uh, sitting uh, on their knees, right, in traditional sort of style. Now they are sitting at the tables, dressed in uh, tuxedos. Uh, and so everything is being shifted and changed around. Um, if you have, I believe this is around maybe 14, 15 minutes long. If you have a little bit of time, uh, this is a nice segment from Feature History if you want some more kind of visualizations, right, about the discussions we're having here. Uh, this is a great shout out to Feature History. Um, with making the Magi Restoration video here. So if you have like 15 minutes of time, if you want some uh, nice visuals, definitely give it a watch. And so this starts Japan's industrial revolution from the, from the 1870s and catapulting themselves onward. Um, and so the government itself was, you know, building railroads, better, um, uh, better road systems, uh, having land reforms, uh, agricultural reforms, etc. Um, you know, they wanted to emulate the uh, European markets. And so they started to create more factories for themselves and pretty quickly started to compete with British products, right, in China and India as well. So economically, they're getting more on a worldwide footing here. Um, these working mills, these factories are now employing more and more women. At a certain point in time, they were employing mostly women. Half of them were younger than 20. Uh, and so now we're really seeing a societal change, right? Now women are going into the workforce. Now we are seeing, as we're going to see in a slide or two, women are also being sent abroad, right, for study abroad programs. Uh, you know, the government is really, really pushing, right, modernization on an enormous scale. And so they are incentivizing businesses to grow. Um, they are bringing in all of these specialists from around the world, and they are, you know, going to modernize the commercial, societal, and military uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, segments, right, of Japanese society itself. Uh, and so over time, uh, we do start to see, uh, you know, this more Europeanization, right, kind of occur and industrialization uh, of mainland Japan. Of course, uh, the factory systems, right, um, being created, and you know, eventually, some of the most top-tier quality products, right, uh, 
uh, started to becoming started to uh, you know develop and be made in Japan even up to the modern day today some some of the best products in the world are Japanese made right um, the factory systems laid in place are very top quality right but this kind of scenery here with the railroads and the factories and the coal smoke billowing from you know from up top this is completely the antithesis of what happened you know a few decades prior to this where all of this would have been you know traditional uh, buildings and let's say a, you know boats everywhere fishing right kind of more of a feudalistic uh, type of scene so very fast expansion uh, railroads modernization right everything that we've been talking about right and this is just even another representation of that socially Japan started to obviously change as well so going from the feudal system towards a relatively modern uh, system uh, was going to change a number of things um, you know regardless of let's say subcategories right it was having it was having a enormous effect on large sections of the society uh, and so you know now people were starting to have more of a middle class right you can move up the scales so a traditional feudalistic system would be whatever class you are born into, that's where you are staying. Now, whatever class you are born into, in a more capitalistic sense, right? If you're working hard enough, you make more money, you can bounce around and go up and down the economic or the socioeconomic ladder, so to speak. Uh, education and schooling was much more wildly prevalent. The Meiji uh, leaders wanted a more Western-based education system. Uh, and were sending thousands of students to the US and Europe for training and for education. They were also hiring more than 3,000 Westerners to come to Japan, like we were talking about earlier, to teach modern science, mathematics, technology, foreign languages in Japan. So they were truly trying to uh, have also an intellectual right uh, renaissance, if you will. And Japan's industrial might grew significantly from this. On the right hand side, we have a photograph, right, of the first Japanese study abroad female sent to the US, sponsored by the government themselves, right? This is from 1872. Something that you would not see a few decades prior to this. Japanese militarization, perhaps the most uh, well remembered slash influential part of this industrialization uh, because Japan ended up being at the center of Japanese Chinese relations and then Japanese American relations as we are kind of progressing and moving forward into uh, the world wars and especially World War II down the road. So during the Meiji period, as Japan is becoming far more modernized, as they are now growing and becoming a much more viable power in terms of, let's say, the Western colonial powers, uh, we start to see that they are sort of trying to come up on the same type of, you know, uh, military strength and level, right? And eventually are going to become stronger enough to the point where they now can turn the tables against these traditional European and American powers. And so they remembered very, very well the 1854 opening of the floodgates. Remember the Admiral, right? The Matthew Perry we were talking about uh, when he came in guns blazing with his fleet and forced the Japanese to open up uh, you know, their isolation policy. They remembered that very well, and they do not like to be bullied because it is a sign of dishonor and disrespect. And so they always remember that, and they did not want that to happen again. And so now they're going more on the offensive as they are growing in strength. And we started to get skirmishes and wars between Japan and China, right? The Sino-Japanese War, the first one. Fighting between the, the last dynasty of China, the Qing Empire, or the Qing Dynasty, uh, and Japan's. And so they were here fighting primarily over the Korean Peninsula, 
And after a few months of fighting back and forth, Japan ended up being the victor. Uh, not too long after, a few years later, one of the most consequential and, uh, let's say, worldwide shattering news was that the J Japanese ended up defeating the Russians on the slopes of Manchuria and Korea. Uh, and so this was sending shockwaves, right? So in the eastern slopes uh, on the border of China, Russia and Japan, Japan starts to go into Manchuria, sort of the northeastern portion of China in modern day what is, let's say, Manchuria slash Mongolia. Uh, and they end up getting into uh, skirmishes, right? Eventually a very short and brief war. And up until this point in time, for decades, right, the Europeans have been seen as this huge megalith of a military colonizing power around the world, right? sailing wherever they want to, making colonies, right, and kind of, uh, you know, establishing very beneficial trade agreements for them. And it was almost unthinkable for an Asian power at this time to even contend and, God forbid, beat a European power. And especially the Russian Empire at this time was this massive amounts of territory. The Russian Tsar was so wealthy, right? One of the great absolute monarchs of the day, as we've seen in some of our lectures. And so the Russo-Japanese War ended up with the Japanese not only defeating them, but decisively defeating them. Because once again, they have the best, uh, the best cannons now, the best rifles, uh, the best military training, right? They hired all of these experts from around the world. And so this very cutting edge, modernized Japanese uh, military was going up against the Russian military, which, you know, the Empire of Russia at the time was so big and large and laborious to uh, defend. The Eastern troops were probably a little like run down, had not the best training or not the best, uh, you know, uh, weaponry at the time. And so it, it was going to be a decisive victory for the Japanese, of course. And so this was seen as a huge shift in not only regional Asian history, but also world history. We also see that the emperor of Japan starts to take his personal security to the next level by instituting this new royal guard called the Imperial Guard. And so this new form of military uh, personnel, sort of the best of the best, starts to get formed into the Imperial Guard to protect the Emperor himself, the family. And eventually, they use this new model of the Imperial Guard and all of this uh, ultra-rigorous training, and then they impart that onto the rest of the military. And it, the new Imperial Army that would come into fruition would become one of the strongest and most disciplined militaries in the world, right? As we're going to see within a couple of decades. And so this is an example, right? A visualization example of the uh, Russo-Japanese War. And on the left-hand side here, you can see the flag, the banner, right? Of the rising sun of the Japanese. And boy, is it a rising sun, right? They are the rising power in the region, for sure. Uh, we start to see political cartoons around the world. These are American cartoons. Um, the one here... On the left-hand side, right, has the Tsar of Russia um, with his cloak, uh, with his uh, golden crown and his uh, cross. Uh, here we have the newly formed, right, Japanese officer, very militarized, as you can see, uh, with the uh, rising sun flag draped across him, right, and the U.S. kind of trying to be some type of mediator. Ironic, since the U.S. came guns blazing, right, with their open-door tactics. Uh, and here... Just as the world has seen the two powers, right, in a very, uh, in a very intel intelligent way for them to portray this visually. So Japan here is seen as a small, uh, quote, weak, right, whatever you want to call it, right, a small power, right, a small Asian man here. And here on the right hand side, you have this big laborious bear, right, encompassing Russia, the big empire. And here, right. Haven't you had enough? Japan is asking. And of course, the Russian Empire is bloodied and beaten 
right? And this guy has not even broken a sweat. And so the conception of these two powers is one way and the outcome of this war was completely a different way. And so everyone is now seeing that Japan truly is coming right into their own. Now, as we're going to be seeing, Imperial Japan coming up and up. So after a couple of decades, right, of the Meiji Restoration and of the policies that followed afterwards, which were essentially the same and just kept modernization efforts growing, uh, Japan ended up hitting a uh, glass ceiling because the island nation of Japan is not that large, right? It only has so much national resources available to it. And so eventually they started to, as, as you know, especially as your industry grows and your economies are growing and your military needs are growing, you need more coal, rubber, iron, right? All of these large, heavy materials. And so they looked towards mainland China for all of these uh, big resources. And boy, did they have them in Manchuria, um, that northeastern Chinese province, right, uh, that we were discussing earlier. And so Japan wanted to invade uh, as the military was growing stronger and their need and hunger for these resources grew. But they wanted a scapegoat. They wanted to say that, well, maybe it was the Chinese that had enticed us to war. Uh, and so this was known as the Manchurian Incident where uh, a few Japanese railways were blown to smithereens using dynamite. And so they were saying, well, look, these are Chinese agents, right, blowing up our railroads. They're starting war. They are sending their spies to our nation to destroy, right, Japan and to start up, you know, uh, animosity. Uh, at the time, the League of Nations uh, sends a five-person committee and they end up writing what is called the Leighton Report. And so essentially the League of Nations, which is a very early precursor of the United Nations that we have today, but this was a much more non-successful version of it, uh, they go in, have their own investigation, and find out that it was Japan that actually sabotaged the whole thing to make it look like the Chinese had waged war on them when, in fact, they did not. They needed a scapegoat. And so Japan ended up getting their way and invading Manchuria. Now, if you have a couple of minutes of free time, this is a short video. Uh, for, uh, sort of archival footage of Japanese invasion of Manchuria and some videos and uh, primary source photos of the entirety of this event. And this map represents very nicely, right, um, all of the territorial expansion that we are seeing from a now modern Japan. And this is the complete antithesis from a few decades ago. Right. When Japan is very isolated all by itself and America forces its way in for trade. And from that moment, right, fast forward a few decades. And now Japan is not only right the rising sun, this new industrial power and might in the east. But now they've taken over all of these islands. They've pushed north, right, into what was, um, you know, Russian territory. They now went into Korea, into Manchuria, and now have been getting into various pockets of China. And so they are truly, right, just spreading their wings and spreading militarily. Uh, an amazing feat, all things considered, right? Uh, and their sort of almost religious obsessiveness with industrialization ended up, in this particular sense, being a enormous positive, right? They ended up getting what they wanted. They ended up getting, uh, they ended up being stronger uh, militarily. They ended up having a better negotiating seat, right, uh, at the uh, diplomatic table. Uh, and so uh, they truly did build themselves up in that sense. However, down the road, uh, when we are going to be looking at uh, let's say the end result of World War II, and I'll get to that in a couple of slides as like my final commentary, uh, it's going to be their downfall. Uh, we eventually start seeing um, from this map, right, that we saw earlier, right, and as Japan is going into mainland China, uh, eventually we start to get, you know, these large battles and skirmishes, of course, 
But of course, also we start to get atrocities uh, and massacres from one side or another because we have animosity between the Japanese, between the Chinese. Uh, they don't like each other historically. Uh, and so regional differences are you know, coming into play. And so here, the rape of Nanjing. Nanjing used to be the capital uh, city of uh, you know, China, right, and the nationalists. And so during this battle, the battle itself took approximately a quarter of a million lives. The city was utterly sacked, plundering, looting, rape, all of this conquest military mentality was taking hold. And the importance of this, because it is not typically historically discussed too often, the importance of this is because as, and we're going to get into it in the last sections of today's lecture with the rise of communist China, but you know, as China is losing ground to the Europeans over the centuries, the Qing dynasty is losing control. The Nationalist Party now is like losing control over the Japanese invaders. Uh, folks are looking at the government structures in China, the Chinese themselves, and being becoming far more distrustful of them and not having confidence in them any longer. And so we end up getting the rise of this new leader. Mao Zedong, the communistic leader and party of China, which, as we know today, is going to be the beginning seeds and foundations of the communistic party of China as we know of it today. And so the rape of Nanjing and the Japanese uh, incursions into mainland China further all of the instability that the region was having within China, as we will discuss you know, in the third part of the lecture. Uh, and so as Japan is rising, it is causing further and further discontent within China itself and is one more reason why the people of China eventually sort of religiously start to give all of this power and belief towards this one communistic vision and propaganda. Now, this is a wonderful video uh, showcasing the uh, rape in Nanjing. Uh, and how the early on scholars of this were actually looking through archival evidence to bring it forth uh, into the kind of historical limelight. Because uh, it is not something that was typically discussed, right? Uh, or research. And so it's a nice discussion of all of that. And so by the time we are having, and I believe this is my last slide, yes. Um, and so by the time we are approaching World War II, in a sense of, let's say, Eastern Asian history. By the time we're approaching World War II, Japan, the military powerhouse of the region, uh, has Manchuria under its heel, Korea, large sections of uh, China, uh, all of this, uh, you know, Indochina and uh, territory, right? The Philippines, New Guinea, all of these various islands, right? It is really, really expanded territorially and militarily. Uh, and so my end thoughts on Japan before we get into World War II, which is a completely different lecture. So I want to just, you know, keep those separate. But leading up to World War II, Japan kept increasing its territory over time. But like I said before, their, their memories of the Europeans coming in and asserting or trying to assert their dominance, the Americans coming in and doing the same thing, that left a sort of mental scar on the psyche of the Japanese. And so they put so much energy into militarization and industrialization that up until World War II, it had been very successful for them, right? They expanded. They, they got what they wanted. No one was messing with them any longer, right? They took them seriously. However, what was their rise is also going to be their downfall. And we're going to see this later on in the World War II lecture, but I'll just preface it here. So as Japan ends up getting sucked into World War II and goes up against the United States, and the United States eventually has this very bloody and brutal war in the Pacific against Japan. It is all ultimately going to end in 1945 with the United States bombing uh, two Japanese cities with uh, 
nuclear weapons, right? Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And so with the bombing of those two cities and the deaths of hundreds of thousands, Japan, in a fatal stroke within a few years of war, ends up losing all of their territory and they end up losing their sovereignty. They essentially go become under the wing of United States hegemony and protection. And so ironically, the very same concept and the very same determination that brought this new imperial Japan into prominence, right? And brought them the respect uh, that they wanted from all of these foreign powers uh, ended up actually in the long run, unbeknownst to them, being their downfall. Uh, and so very interesting history here. And so as we're closing the discussions on the Meiji Restoration, uh, industrialization was initially used as we are discussing, right, from the very early slides, you know, to improve people's lives, to have better, more efficient methods of, you know, making products, mechanization, etc. Eventually, people take advantage of that and convert it into better, let's say, economics and business to really, you know, get more profits, more factories. Eventually, countries and nations and the peoples, such as the Japanese, took these industrialization policies and, let's say, the technology and used it to truly catapult themselves into a military powerhouse, right? And so they're taking various aspects of industrialization, right, and, and using it to mold and fit their narrative and whatever they need to use it for. Right. Okay, part three, rise of communist China. My apologies. Let me take a swig of water before we continue. Okay, so let's talk about the Qing Dynasty. So this is, as I call, the old guard. So China has a very long and rich history, right? Obviously, right? They're millennia old. Oh, I got my point wrong. And so the very last great dynasty that they had was the Qing Dynasty. And so they had been in power for a few centuries up until this point in time. And one of the was one of the greatest dynasties that China had ever seen. Amazing bureaucratic measures in government, vast trade routes, large and powerful, you know, fiefdoms under the emperor. Their interaction with the West was initially very beneficial to them. With Western governments coming in and wanting some of that lucrative Chinese trade through the Silk Road and all of these new uh, maritime trade routes. And so they were in a very advantageous position with people coming in through what is known here as the imperial tributary system, where we have folks coming in and diplomats coming in, and they are bowing to the emperor. They are bestowing these large beautiful gifts to the emperor and you know essentially you know exclaiming that the emperor is above all right he is the emperor and so we start to see british ships in the mid 1600s starting to show up trade starting to start and flourish eventually we start to see other europeans come in wanting part of that trade as well however in the back of their minds all of these Europeans, and we've, we've, we've studied Europe pretty extensively so far, and all of these absolute monarchies, right, and all this nationalism that's growing in Europe. And so for many of these diplomats, kneeling before the emperor and exclaiming that, yes, you are the king of kings, you are the emperor, you are this and that, and all of these kind of, you know, courtly gestures. But acknowledging the emperor as above their own monarchs was to them just unacceptable. They did not want to follow that train of thought. And so we'll keep that in mind as we're moving forward. 
And so we have a couple of paintings here, right, kind of depicting, the, you know, China uh, and all of these kind of new uh, flags and trading posts, right, established on the coast um, so that all of this trade and goods are now going to be, uh, you know, uh, proliferated, right, throughout China and all of this vast wealth going from hand to hand. But we are now going to enter what is known as the century of humiliation. And I don't know how to use that ter term lightly, but that is essentially what it is seen as and called. So from the mid 1700s to the mid 1800s or so. It all starts off with, remember when we said the Europeans did not necessarily like for, you know, the groveling in front of the emperor and saying that, yes, you are above our own monarchs. The Europeans want to establish more beneficial trade routes. They want to be in more control over China and all these various regions. And so we start to see that, you know, Britain ends up gaining control over today's India, right, and the Mughal em Empire. And from this, the East India uh, Trading Company, right, a kind of Briti British subsidiary economic uh, trading company, but as sort of like a quasi-military company as well, a very powerful corporation, essentially, um, ends up, you know, getting possession of like this huge opium uh, monopoly that the Mughal emperors had because they were so close to Afghanistan and all of the opium uh, fields, right? Opium being a very addictive drug that you can smoke through opium dens. And so we start to see that, you know, they had an enormous, let's say, stock, right, in the British possession. And they thought to themselves, you know what, hey, let's try selling some of this to China to pay off some of the local debts that we are having and incurring. And so they started this process and sales soared. They started to first in 1730 trade with a, around 15 tons of opium. And by 1773, only 43 years later, around 2000 tons. So as you can tell, this was perhaps the first true drug war of the uh, world, right? So in world history, probably very few drug wars if there's such a thing as you know drug history i guess but this is definitely on the top three list for sure if not first spot and so this resulted in one of the greatest worldwide and historical opium slash drug addictions in history with around 12 million addicts or even more perhaps depending on the historical data and censuses that we have uh in 1838 so millions right of chinese that are addicted to opium and drug addiction is a terrible thing right and we are seeing various drug epidemics now right even in modern history and so what does drug epidemics lead towards it leads to you becoming slower uh your mental capabilities uh, being reduced you are mentally and physically dependent on this drug so much so to the point that you are willing to sell all your money and your belongings and your house, right? Just to get another addictive hit. And so as society is seeing all of these essentially drug addicts, right? Walking through the streets, uh, sunken skin, hungry, you know, their money and belongings wasting away. Uh, the emperor of the, the, the Qing dynasty is, you know, starting to lose some of that loyalty and prestige from the Chinese uh, people, right? And so, because the emperor is supposed to be the protector, right? If anything goes wrong, you're supposed to come in and fix it. However, in in the process of trying to fix this, there is so much money being made from opium that, of course, the foreign European powers are not going to allow this huge money-making machine to just stop. And so we have two wars, or in totality, called the Opium Wars, where uh, where the UK and slash France and the Qing Dynasty are warring over these conflicting viewpoints on trade, diplomacy, 
um, all of these drugs being peddled in, right? And who has more power and authority in China? And so from the first war, the Chinese armies were defeated, right? Because they were not as militarily advanced as the European counterparts. And so they had to sign some unsavory agreements. The second war that they had shortly after, the emperor was forced to sign even more unfair trade agreements and giving up various territory, thereby lowering the prestige and respect of the uh, dynasty even further. And so we see over time that the Europeans are essentially slicing up China into various sections so that they have regional control over various parts of coastal China and can have a very beneficial and lucrative trade. Um, have essentially wonderful goods from China, silk and all of these other beautiful products come in and so that they could sell into the Middle East, they could sell to India, they could sell to Europe, the Americas, what have you. And at the same time, they are selling them all of these products for high rates, especially, let's say, opium, because they want to get them more addicted. They want to have them hooked on the stuff. And so what once turned from uh, this kind of respectful, uh, let's say, adherence towards the uh, king em uh, emperorship, right, and dynasty, and, you know, bowing and having this deference towards the emperor and saying, king of kings, please, uh, you know, we are here for trading. What turned from that eventually turns into millions of, let's say, opium addictions, right? Um, and the, you know, wearing away of this international prestige uh, and uh, power. China, for the longest time, also in American and European literature, was then known as the sick man of Asia. So China was, you know, literally just looked upon on the global world history stage as losing more and more influence, right? Because all of these different powers were coming in and sectioning off, right, uh, power. And so we have the very famous uh, creation of what we have here in this primary source photo, opium dens, right? You have uh, the opium, you can put that in the pipe and you end up smoking it and essentially getting high on your uh, on your supply. And so opium dens were uh, popping up all over China and the drug epidemic was just widespread. Um, and so the opium war and epidemic by itself was not, let's say, the only reason why the Qing Dynasty was losing this power and control. It was a multi-factored reason, right? Uh, but just another, another step, another reason for, let's say, this uh, specific power dynamic interaction to change. Eventually, we have the Americans coming in, right? The Americans wanting to create what they end up calling the open door policy. Um, where they want an open form of trade from China, between China and all countries equally. So as the United States, and we I've kind of sprinkled the U.S. in between the lecture today, but as the U.S. is growing in power and might over the 1800s, especially um, towards the turn of the century, right, around 1900 or so, in 1898, the U.S. wins the Spanish-American War. They went up against Spain, and they end up uh, winning a few territories in the Caribbean and the Philippines. So it's not widely remembered that the United States was in control of the Philippine Islands for a certain portion of time. And so once the U.S. gets control of that, they thought to themselves, aha, China is so close. We can use the Philippines as a stepping stone to this large, lucrative market. And so in the graphic here on the right-hand side, let me get my pointer. Uncle Sam, or the U.S., is seen with all of these goods, right? Steel rails, bridges, education, religion, all of these kind of different products that they have, and using the Philippines as a stepping stone to China, right? And if you can read the small... Um, Posters here, wanted, uh, 100,000 bridges, 500,000 engines, 2 million cars, 400,000 rails, right? All of this demand for goods. And so even the U.S. is now coming in and forcing the other European nations to allow them, right, to enter the game itself. But all, all that this ends up doing is, as I say in the uh, lower 
uh, explanation here in the open door policy is this is even a further symbol of Chinese national humiliation. And so that century of humiliation, that century of dishonor, of European powers coming in and dictating to the Chinese what they can or cannot do, uh, what trading agreements are going to be imposed upon them, the United States coming in later on and doing the same thing. China is feeling and reeling back from this power disparity, right? And so where, let's say in stark contrast, as we finished up with the Meiji Restoration, Japan took that very early signal and said, oh, geez, we have to modernize quickly, extremely quickly. Otherwise, right, we are going to not be able to defend ourselves. Uh, in stark contrast with the Japanese model, which was far more successful in this endeavor, the Chinese had uh, a much more difficult path right ahead of them, and they were not as successful at deterring all of these foreign powers to do so. And here we have a political cartoon showing this sort of great American renewed strength of the United States coming in and telling these European nations that no, no, no. Uh, you know, we are now having an equal go at China, right? I will now also be a player in this. And if you can notice, all of these European powers, right, uh, are having scissors. And so they are cutting up and chopping up China itself, right, into however many portions or sections that they need. Um, and so the U.S. is coming in and saying, nope, we are all, right, trying to have our fair share of the pie. History, folks, you got to love it. So, in comes the communists. And so I wanted to prelude all of this information because we have to understand that mindset within mainland China before we get into this large sort of overall discussion, discussion of the rise of communism within China. So for the last few decades, as we've seen, Mainland China and the Chinese have been reeling back. They've been reeling back from the Europeans, from the Americans. Um, during the Sino-Japanese Wars, we see that even Japan is imp and Imperial Japan is conquering their way through Manchuria and Korea and even parts of mainland China as well. China is, you know, reeling back from defeat after defeat. Uh, and so they, the people themselves, number one, are absolutely outraged at the government. Uh, the Qing Dynasty was crumbling. Its power and authority was crumbling as well. And so the remnants of that government was called now the nationalist government. Uh, and so they did not, you know, have enough power or prestige or authority or results to, let's say, stem any possible civil war. And of course, civil war started to break out. So at the beginning in 1927 all the way to 1949, we start to see a series of civil war um, engagements between the nationalists and the, the new Communist Party of China. Now, over time here and there, because it was an on again, off again type of civil war, because uh, in between, they kind of joined up together at times to fight off the Japanese threats and incursions, especially during World War II. Um, but eventually, after World War II, right, where a lot of this is taking form and shape as well, after World War II closes um, and the sort of f uh, foreign enemy is no longer there in the form of the imperial Japanese um, power and might, uh, the nationalists and the communists are at each other's throats again. And the leader of the communists ends up, you know, rallying his troops, Mao Zedong. And eventually, after three hard years of bloody campaigning, ends up victorious and proclaiming Beijing the capital of now the Communistic Party of China, or the, CC, uh, the CPC. The nationalist government fled to Taiwan, proclaiming themselves the legitimate rulers and sort of hereditary uh, rulers of these Chinese uh, dynasties, which is why even mainland China today, they do not recognize Taiwan. And if you speak of Taiwan and say that they are independent, China does not want to do business with you. Uh, and so 
uh, even today, I believe within our lifetime, as China is now undeniably and objectively speaking, growing in power, growing in prominence, uh, they eventually perhaps are going to try to incorporate Taiwan into their fold as well to kind of end this generational divide. And so we start to see, right, uh, the civil war between uh, the nationalists, right, and kind of rallying the troops versus the communists, right, and trying to rally the troops on both ends of the ideological uh, spectrum here. Uh, and so right, over time, right, we start to see that the war continues on and on. But eventually, we start to see that the communist party within China grows uh, exponentially because their mandate was they were a party supposedly right ideologically they were a party of the people they were a party of the peasants and so here we we gloriously see i mean chinese propaganda is amazing and beautiful but here we see uh mao zedong here right in his glorious form uh, with all of the propaganda and the people right just you know saluting him right the beautiful flags here um you know there's a sign towards uh, the Soviet Union here, right, kind of sign as well, right, the inheritors of Marxism from the Soviet Union. Uh, and so everyone is smiling and everyone is having a wonderful go at it. Pro amazing propaganda, right? Uh, and so Mao Zedong eventually becomes, right, the head honcho, the leader, and consolidates power in mainland China. But there are going to be a number of issues that come along with our responsibility. Uh, and, you know, completely change the regional dynamics, which we are now... Uh, you know, noticing today, right, in its final repercussion form. Uh, here's a, an amazing uh, painting. And so this is uh, s supposed to depict uh, Mao Zedong and his uh, various leaders here, right, or like his original OG cabinet members, uh, and supposed to be uh, in Tiananmen Square uh, giving a speech to the people, right? And so this is supposed to be the founding of a nation, right? And, you know, kind of a very propagandistic, uh, you know, way of sh demonstrating that uh, he is the man of the people. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, for like, you know, some political slash art history, uh, some of these individuals here, right? They're standing over here. Uh, this entire painting, over time, as Mao Zedong was getting a little more like kooky, right? And loopy in the head. Um, and thinking that everyone is going to overthrow him, uh, they end up repainting these figures. So they end up re like taking somebody out, putting another person in, taking another person out, putting another person in. So there's like five, six, something like ver different versions of this painting. Um, and so just a testament of, let's say, the powerful Chinese propaganda machine that uh, was being developed. But let's go through some main key milestones of post-World War II China, right? As China officially becomes communistic under Mao Zedong, they defeated the nationalists. This is communist China. What did it look like? What were some issues? So the main, uh, let's say, ideology of the day and age was Maoism. This was some variety of this Marxist, Leninist, uh, you know, Soviet Union ideology um, that they inherited, but Mao Zedong was developing this because he wanted this revolution to be uh, stemming from the people, from the agricultural sector, from the peasants. Because at this day and age, the majority of the Chinese population were peasants. And we're talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of people, right? This is an enormous population group we're talking about. And so he's obviously talking to the largest sector of the population, to the peasants, towards the agricultural section and saying... You know, you are going to be essential for revolution in this country and that you are going to be even better suited for life and this new egalitarian society that we want to build. You are going to be even more better at this than the industrial workers. Note industrial workers, right? We are having industrialization conversations throughout this whole lecture. Industry comes in here once again. And so... As China finally sort of, if you will, right, after all the civil wars and chaos, they are now unified under one political rule, right, of Mao Zedong and communistic China. They have a little room to breathe and kind of figure things out. And so 
they remembered the century of humiliation. They remembered the European and the American intervention in their economic and political system. So, so just like the Japanese, they wanted to now strengthen themselves as well. And to do so, they needed to industrialize. And so this Maoism revolution, right, was also called the continued revolution under the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, and stipulated that class enemy warfare would always exist. And so you had to be ever vigilant against class warfare. And so essentially all of the higher ups, the managers, the capitalists within China were now seen as the bad guys. And all of the peasants and the farmers, uh, the workers were now seen idealistically, morally, you know, in a virtue sense as the good guys. And so... There was a couple main uh, big sort of, you know, events during Mao's campaign to industrialize the nation and bring it to its feet. The first one was called the Great Leap Forward. And this was a few years of, let's say, modernization. Uh, there was a, a, you know, a couple of attempts at this, but the main one was right after World War um, Two. Uh, you know, for like a four or five year gap period. And so this was his campaign to reconstruct the country from a agrarian or agricultural economy into a communistic society with more, uh, let's say, industrial might. And so this feeling and this kind of pressing issue was, of course, like we said, brought on by this century of humiliation, Japanese occupation, European American intervention, World War II, etc. And so as he, from a governmental standpoint, right, up above, is mandating to the people that we have to push forward economically, and they are making these various economic uh, changes and policies uh, in order to, quote-unquote, industrialize them as fast as humanly possible. But with the sheer amount of people that they had and the sheer amount of, let's say, local farmland that they had, they made some terrible miscalculations. So at this point in time, most of the farmland was family owned, right? Small little family units of farmland. They somehow wanted to convert that individualistic family farmland into a unified communal farming industrial might system. You know, so they thought, it, you know, it would improve efficiency, right? They were terribly wrong. And so this led to the starvation of millions of people. And so they mismanaged goods. They mismanaged products. Um, they even asked for, uh, they did like uh, national requests, let's say, of like any metals that you own, uh, spoons, plates, like whatever metals you had, send it to the state because we need the metals in order to create, let's say, these large factories, to make these uh, warehouses, these uh, industries, to make more iron, whatever, right? To like build up factories like the West has and J Japan has, etc. But in, in so doing, they stripped the local populace of their much needed goods to actually farm and plow the land and do whatever else they needed to do, plus the additional mismanagement of con converting all of these uh, family farmland into these kind of communal hubs. The efficiency of the farming went down considerably and that led to massive amounts of starvation we had millions of people starved to death the first that was the first blunder of Mao Zedong the second blunder was the cultural revolution from 66 to 76 so this was a 10-year period and there's a couple of cultural revolutions but this was a big one where uh, the stated goal was to preserve Chinese communism by purging any capitalistic or Western elements from Chinese society or to especially reimpose sort of this Maoism, Mao Zedong amounts of thought. And so ideologically, you know, that seems pretty sound. OK, you want to kind of reinforce your national vision and narrative, I suppose. But it led to you know, the persecution of millions, right? And essentially you're, um, you know, unbeknownst to them at the top, or maybe beknownst to them, I'm not sure, but it resulted in the people 
you know, turning on themselves. You turning against your neighbor and saying, you know, they have more money than us. They're probably part of the, you know, capitalistic, you know, sector or whatever, right? They have to go down. And so people started to turn on each other. So in the middle of massive, let's say, starvation waves and food plummeting, people are now at each other's throats culturally and turning each other in for whatever dumb reasons. Um, and so the main point of this was that although some industrialization efforts had been achieved due to all of this, you know, effort, it was not nearly as efficient as it should have been. And it resulted at the cost of 45 to 60 million people dead within China. And so during the World War Two, excuse me, during the World War One slash World War Two kind of era of world history, folks always let's say villainize Hitler and the the Holocaust, right? And the millions of people that he brutally uh, and systematically murdered. People villainize Stalin for, for losing 20 million people in World War II and perhaps sending, you know, a few million more to the gul gulags in Northern Siberia for re-education because they were his political enemies, right? Obviously both terrible individuals they did terrible atrocities but for whatever reason Mao Zedong is never really put in that same category although he should potentially be for the running for number one because he he wins the prize for the sheer amounts of devastation of human loss 45 to 60 million souls perished under his reign and leadership uh, and it was pretty much an iron-fisted rule because Mao Zedong eventually got so paranoid to the point where, th just like that painting we saw, he was rewriting history. He had people executed. He had people painted out of the sort of national paintings and narratives. Uh, it, got, it got pretty brutal and bad. Here's a video to watch if you have a few minutes of time uh, on the great, the great Leap Forward. Uh, describing in some more detail. Uh, exactly what happened with the Great Leap Forward, how they wanted to bring forth all of this uh, industrialization and to really push China into the new uh, century. But in doing so, massive starvation on the streets right, of China, millions perishing. People so hungry, like on the left-hand side, this man um, was trying to eat bark off of a tree. That is how hungry some folks got. Uh, mothers, right, not being able to feed their kids, just terrible amounts of human suffering and loss, all for the sake of industrialization. So industrialization definitely has its pros, if done correctly, and in, and in certain, you know, aspects. Its negatives are uh, in the westernized countries, and uh, in the westernized countries we saw that overpopulation, right, uh, issues with sanitation, uh, etc., wage labor change. Uh, and here in the worst of examples, once you kind of, you know, have a much, much larger population like China had at the time, any small miscalculation or misstep like they had, for instance, in the Western world was, you know, blown to extreme proportions here, right? Because any small mistake that they made was affecting tens of millions. This is a wonderful interview from, um, it is a member of the Red Guard during the Cultural Revolution in Mao Zedong's reign. And so this gentleman uh, is now living outside of China, of course, but he is being interviewed and remembers uh, some of his, uh, you know, past, you know, let's say jobs and responsibilities as a member of the cultural Red Guard of this cultural revolution. Essentially, the Red Guard were part of the state and they would go in and try to uh, pick apart anyone who is part of this capitalistic sort of, uh, you know, subcells, right, of Chinese society. And so he describes to himself and gets into tears about his childhood teacher, this wonderful, sweet lady that he loved. And he heard that she was on the next uh, list of people that needed to be, let's say, brutalized because they were on the target list, right, of being too proto-capitalist. And he, he mentions in the video that he gets there too late. 
and he starts tearing up because he's just like, I should have done better. And so, you know, the Cultural Revolution definitely had a long, uh, long influence on China. But this is a definitely a good video to watch if you want a small, like, four or five minute snippet uh, into what it was. This is a much longer form uh, detail. If and this is not necessary, but this is a wonderful film. Uh, this it's long. It's around like two hours long, right? So I mean, this is a pretty big investment. But this is a movie called To Live, and this is a man's tragic life detailed during the history of China, uh, from the Civil War days between the Nationalists and the Communistic Party, all the way up to the 1980s, and so it details one man's life you know and you see the civil wars you see the rise of the communists you see the great leap forwards you see the gambling and opium addictions you see the massive starvation on the streets you see the cultural revolution happening like just all of it the, the 1900s was a very crazy and tumultuous time for china uh, i think objectively speaking right it was filled with many revolutions uh it was filled with much strife and difficulty uh, and this video does a fantastic job of detailing a lot, detailing a lot of that. So if you're really curious in this day and age, and you have a couple hours of free time, uh, you know this is definitely a good movie to watch. Has some very good English subtitles, uh, and at certain times is, uh, you know, very uh, kind of brutalistic in the fashion that it portrays this man's life. So with that, uh, we are at the end of the lecture. But um, I will just give some wrapping. Uh, end thoughts on let's say the rise of China communistic section uh, because this is like post World War II China uh, we are going to discuss uh, you know China a little bit you know more in various other lectures uh, as we're kind of detailing some connections to the modern day the modern world uh, however from this kind of post World War II day and age where China was trying to modernize itself industrialize get on the same footing as these western powers as the united states etc we are going to start seeing that you know they are industrializing at an incredible rate and even up to what was it approximately 20 years ago the United States and their various projections of China were still not seeing it as a major threat. They still saw China as the quote-unquote sleeping dragon, where maybe eventually down the road they'll become a threat, but not yet. Versus today, in 2020 currently, China is having the same G GDP and industrial output as the United States. China is manufacturing most of the world's commodities. China is growing their military and their economic influence around the region and world at an extraordinary rate. Unlike the United States that seems to get into economic and military warfare around the world, China is dumping tens of billions of dollars into various portions of the world, both in South America, Africa, especially the Middle East, creating these economic trade routes. And so the projections are that within five to 10 years from now, China is going to have a much larger GDP than the United States, and that the United States is going to have to learn and contend with not being the main sole hegemonic power in the world any longer, that we are now going to be heading towards, once again, a two superpower uh, world dynamic. And so this is going to be a very interesting conversation for us to have, because as we saw here in the historical, uh, you know, chapters, right, in our discussions of, let's say, post-World War II Chinese history and all the experiences in the 1800s, they definitely have in the national narrative and consciousness a, a deep memory of everything that happened. And they do have a long, rich history. And so... It is going to be very interesting 21st century to see the rise of China as a main superpower and how the United States is going to adjust to it, either successfully or unsuccessfully. And so we'll have more conversations about that later, and I'll leave it for another time. But...
that was the end of this lecture and video. A little bit on the longer side, because um, I had to combine a few different uh, themes and aspects, but with the central uh, narrative of industrialization and what that means for the world. Uh, we covered uh, early European slash American industrialization, influences onto Japan and the Meiji Restoration, and then wrapping it up with a discussion of um, the nationalist versus communistic civil war in China and the Chinese major efforts towards industrialization and some of the pros and cons to that. Um, and then at the very tail end of it, China, although it went through an enormous amount of struggle and strife over the last few decades, they have eventually, through blood, sweat and tears, pulled off what they initially envisioned and are now currently um, one of the leading superpowers of the world. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time for our next lecture. Take care.